it's the 100th anniversary of the original Hunchback of Notre Dame film from Universal Studios. It premiered at the Astor Theater in New York City on September 2nd, 1923, but its main release was September 6th. It's not that often when you get to celebrate the 100th anniversary of a film, like we did with Nosferatu last year, but we're going to be seeing that happen more often, especially when we get to the 2030s. <laughs> Jeez. Of course, there's lots of movies I could celebrate of all genres. Uh, one of the best comedies of all time is Safety Last with Harold Lloyd, which just had its 100th anniversary earlier this year. And Cecil B. DeMille's biblical epic, The Original Ten Commandments, will have its 100th this November. But I'm kind of a horror guy, as you know, which makes this one very special to me. And while Hunchback isn't exactly a horror film, it's more of a historical drama, its character, Quasimodo, could be considered the very first universal monster. While he's not actually a monster and has a kind heart, the people in the film view him as a monster in the same way as the Frankenstein monster. He's misunderstood, mistreated, but sympathetic to the viewer. Of course, it's an adaptation of the Victor Hugo novel from 1831. The movie does take some liberties, which is usually the case, but it does capture the same essence of the book with its characters and themes. The film is set in Paris in 1482 and immerses you in a world of corruption and shows a stark divide between the rich and the poor, from luxurious castles where the corrupt wield their power to dark alleys where thieves and beggars scrap for a living. We see all aspects of life and all different social classes. Most of the drama centers around a traveling dancer, Esmeralda. She's the adopted daughter of Clopin, who's sort of like a cult leader, ruling the lower class underworld, and he eventually inspires an uprising. On the other side, you have Jahan, who is the main villain. His role is slightly confusing. He's not a king or a prince. He's just the brother of the archdeacon of Notre Dame, and he happens to be purely evil. He has an obsessive lust for Esmeralda, and this is where all the conflict occurs. But what about Quasimodo, you ask? Well, he's just the poor guy caught in between all the fighting. He's not really the center of the plot, but he steals the show. He's the bell ringer who happens to be half blind, deaf, and disfigured. He's the slave of Jahan and is forced into doing his every wish. One night, Jahan makes Quasimodo stalk Esmeralda. So he carries out his master's orders and grabs her. Just then, Captain Phoebus comes to her rescue. He's like the archetype of the handsome hero character. So he strikes up a romance with her while Quasimodo is sentenced to be whipped in the public square, which is one of the film's most iconic scenes. This is where you start to feel really bad for him while his master, Jahan, gets away with his crimes. While left chained up for God knows how long, he becomes very dehydrated, and in one of the most heartwarming moments, Esmeralda takes pity on him and brings him water. He's very grateful and will eventually return the favor. Jahan is jealous of Captain Phoebus, so while he's with Esmeralda, Jahan dashes in and stabs him in the back, meaning literally, he flees the crime just before the soldiers show up and blame Esmeralda. Then she's taken to the dungeon, and this is one of the more morbid scenes for a silent film. The torture is much more tame than what we've seen today, but the dungeon set with its dark lighting and torture equipment and that guy tied up screaming, it gives you the sense of what kind of bad stuff goes on in this place. It's a prelude to the horror genre to come. After being forced into a false confession, Esmeralda is brought to the gallows to be killed, but Quasimodo comes to her rescue and brings her to the sanctuary. This keeps her safe for a while, but it only delays the inevitable. So on the day she's meant to be turned over for execution, Clopin begins his rebellion, sending all the thieves to storm the cathedral. And this culminates in the final climactic scene, which is impressive, involving tons of extras. Though Jahan is the real villain, Quasimodo ends up not only fighting him, but also fending off the entire mob by throwing blocks and molten lead from the top of the cathedral. It's the classic angry mob scene, later to be repeated in countless universal horror films. This final scene is total chaos of the most epic proportions. The highlight is Lon Chaney as Quasimodo. This film helped him earn the nickname Man of a Thousand Faces. He was already a known character actor by that point, doing his own makeup and changing his face in so many ways that he's unrecognizable from one film to the next. He was always pushing the limits. 
The makeup process and the way he distorted his face was reportedly very painful, and he also demonstrates some impressive stunt work, especially when he climbs down the scenery. It's meant to look like he climbs down the entire cathedral, and even though it was really a bunch of sets closer to the ground, it's still quite a feat. Cheney was raised by deaf parents, both of them deaf, so he had to learn how to communicate visually, which makes him very well suited for silent film. Most of the other actors are really good too. Patsy Ruth Miller as Esmeralda comes off as very natural and doesn't exaggerate the way many silent actors do. Jahan is a great villain, truly a scumbag, though most of it's accomplished by the title cards. After having already stabbed Phoebus, he tells Esmeralda that all I have done was for love for you, but then when she refuses him, he says she'll hang. What kind of love is that? Clopin is really good as the underworld king of thieves, always has that sneering look so you can read on his face what he's thinking. Then there's characters that are very minor but so memorable, like the woman in the window who keeps screaming at Esmeralda. She has a backstory where long ago her baby daughter was kidnapped by gypsies, so she places the blame on Esmeralda and her kind. And I guess, sorry to spoil the twist, but uh, the movie is 100 years old, so Spoiler alert, Esmeralda is the daughter, and the moment she finds this out, just as she's being sentenced to the gallows, gives me goosebumps every time. The way she goes from kill her to oh my god, save her, is just brilliant stuff for 1920s. The set design is magnificent. All the statues, candles, and archways. I am really convinced we are in medieval Paris, especially Notre Dame. It certainly gives you the impression that they actually filmed it at the real cathedral in Paris, but it was all in Burbank, California on the Universal backlot, reconstructed with meticulous detail. They only built the bottom section with the big archways, so whenever you see it in the wide angle, they combined it with a miniature, apparently. It was done all practical, in camera. How the hell it looks so seamless, I couldn't even tell you. The real cathedral in Paris is one of the great wonders of French Gothic architecture and is rich with history spanning many centuries but it's almost impossible not to associate it with Quasimodo the same way you can't think of any castle in Romania without thinking of Dracula, the character. Notre Dame is located not far from the Paris Opera House, which is the setting for Phantom of the Opera, so Quasimodo is in good company. I wish you could visit the actual set from the movie, but it's long gone, which is usually the case due to weather, deterioration, and the changing needs of the studio. But to this day, the Universal Backlot Tour routinely swings by an area called Little Europe. They will tell you this is where not only the Hunchback, but all the Universal monsters were filmed. It is very likely that this is the area where all the villages were filmed, but all the original buildings burned down in a fire in 1967, so everything you see today is probably a reconstruction, if even that. None of it matches any of the scenery in Hunchback. And sadly, the real Notre Dame had a fire in 2019, causing serious damage. We may never know the exact spot where the fake Notre Dame stood, but it has foggy connections with that little Europe set. Universal calls this spot the Court of Miracles. Now, the Court of Miracles is a significant location in the story. It's where all the thieves, beggars, and other outcasts gather. The spot doesn't match the Court of Miracles in the film, nor any other scene, but to make it more confusing, they say the first movie filmed there was The Miracle Man, which also happened to star Lon Chaney. So the exact location is questionable and remains a mystical and elusive holy ground. But there's no mystery to the fact that the film was a huge success. It made a big star out of Lon Chaney and helped build the empire that is Universal Studios. It also laid the groundwork for future adaptations. In my opinion, the 1939 version starring Charles Lawton is vastly superior. I highly recommend that one, especially because there's a much better chance of it appealing to modern viewers. That's often the case with the sound versions. Um, I usually think the sound versions are better, but not always. I still think the original Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney has never been surpassed and we'll be celebrating that one's 100th in a couple years. But anyway, The Hunchback might have helped usher in the wave of silent horror that focused on human deformities, mainly from Universal, including Phantom and The Man Who Laughs. It also helped establish the trope of the Beauty and Beast relationship in cinema. 
Quasimodo also established the cliché of the hunchback character. All throughout the 30s and 40s, there was always a hunchback character, usually as an assistant to a mad scientist. It's a popular trope that's persisted for decades, including TV, cartoons, and even video games. I can never forget those pesky hunchback enemies in Castlevania. So why not see where it all started a hundred years ago? You can find this film quite easily, especially because it's public domain, but most of the versions you'll find look pretty crappy because they were all taken from low quality sources, specifically 16 millimeter reprints. When I first saw it on VHS in the 90s, it looked pretty bad, but it didn't bother me. I only felt that added to its antique historical value, almost as if cameras existed in medieval times, this is what it would look like. In fact, I did a really fun thing with this tape. Using the VCR's audio dub feature, I made a copy and replaced the score with the music of Final Fantasy III on Super Nintendo. I carefully chose the score for each scene and it fit perfectly. Today, you have many more options. If you collect physical media, there is a recent Blu-ray release which gives it justice. So, however you can, give it a watch and celebrate some film history today. Here's to a century of Universal Monsters.